Alexa. Okay, Google. Hey, Siri. Voice assistants hey, are everywhere. What song is this? Uh, Not only in your phone, they're in your doorbell. They're the voice when you call the bank, and they're behind every chatbot. Voice assistants are driven by large language models, a type of AI that supposedly understands, predicts, and then generates our speech. And they're pretty popular for taking calls, especially in industries that are trying to process large call volumes. But how would you feel if an AI was at the other end of an emergency call? Can AI understand human distress? And would it be able to do this? 911, operator 901, where's the emergency? 127, been there. Okay, what's going on there? I'd like to order a pizza for delivery. Ma'am, you've reached 911. This is an emergency yeah, line. Uh, large with half pepperoni, half mushroom. Um, you know you've called 911. This is an emergency line. Do you line. know how long it'll be? Okay, ma'am. Is everything okay over there? Do you have an emergency or not? Yes. And you're unable to talk because... Right, right. Okay, is there someone in the room with you? Just say yes or no. Yes. This caller doesn't sound stereotypically distressed. They don't sound panicked, they don't ask for help, or even use the word help. So how did the call taker listen to those words and figure out that this was a genuine request and not a prank call? It's not really just about those words. This is Professor Elizabeth Stokoe, a conversation analyst who has analysed emergency service calls. Conversation analysts look at talk in slow motion. We slow things down to look at the detail that comprise people's actual everyday encounters. We are interested in every breath, every sigh, every wobble of the voice, every rise in pitch and fall in pitch, every croak, every overlap. What we're looking for when we slow things down is a little bit like when we see the analysis of a football match. We're interested in the setup of a conversation, from turn to turn, from person to person. Turns can be placed really rapidly next to each other. There can be long gaps between turns, there can be no gap between turns, there can be an overlap between turns. Conversation analysts have shown that the placement of turns is pretty important. And in the case of emergency calls, it's one key to understanding how so quickly and so intuitively the call taker figured out what was going on. It's all in the overlap. I'd like to order a pizza for delivery. Ma'am, you've reached 911. This is an emergency yeah. line. Uh, large with half pepperoni, half mushroom. Um, you know you've called 911. This is an emergency Do you line. Know how long it'll be? It's in this interruption that the call takers seem to pick up that this is genuinely please hear me as requesting help, even though I can't use the words to request for help. What we see in non-genuine requests is that that overlapping pattern doesn't happen. And if you're not collecting the recordings, and if you're not analysing the recordings, and if you're not transcribing the recordings in the technical detail that we do, you wouldn't identify what is it that people are actually doing that gets the assistance they need. So what happens if it's not a human on the other end of the line, but an AI? With a colleague, we got ChatGPT to role play the part of the 911 call taker. What the ChatGPT does is treat the caller as a not genuine caller. They actually start to chastise the caller for wasting the police time. They start to threaten the caller with the idea that what they're doing might be illegal when others are in genuine need of assistance. We asked Liz to redo the experiment to see if the response had changed since she last tried. Okay, so let's take the 911 call. So let's start with a prompt so that ChatGPT knows what we're trying to do here. Understood, it says, I'm ready whenever you are. 911, what's your emergency? I'm gonna put in the first thing that the caller says. All right, 127 Denier, can you tell me what's happening there? This is great, this, this is better than the original one that, that I did about a year ago. It's it already got confused last time when that address was put there. Okay, so now I'm going to put the original request in from the call taker, which is the tricky thing. Ma'am, this is 911. Are you unable to speak freely? Wow, amazing. Um, it didn't do that last time either. So now let's put the next part of the caller's message. Um, it's now saying, understood, help is on the way. Are there others with you? Respond with extra toppings if yes, or just the pizza if no. The thing that actually worries me about this is how good it seems to be 
and what people might extrapolate from one instance of it being pretty similar to what the human call taker did to, okay, we don't need dispatches anymore. <laughs> You'd need to do a lot more work. It was really strange when we redid the experiment because so much had changed in what seemed like a relatively short period of time. So can AI understand human distress? So to answer this question, we need to understand something fundamental about human social interaction. And it's something that I've discovered time and time again in my research as a conversation analyst, which is that people are amazing at interacting. Just look at the 911 call that we started with. So humans can understand human distress in the wild, and that's what I can identify and describe in their interactions. But when you ask people to say how interaction works, to kind of go meta on what distress or emotion or other aspects of interaction actually look and sound like, they rarely articulate the kinds of things that people actually do. Instead, it's common to hear sort of pop psychology or stereotypical things that are seldom connected to research on actual interaction. And sometimes such ideas might find their way into research studies themselves. So you get this kind of constantly reproducing cycle of ideas about how interaction works that are never based on sort of direct or scientific observation. And indeed, when I asked ChatGPT to explain how it had come to identify a genuine call, it leaned heavily into pop psychology versions of emotion and how talk works, such as treating things like uh as a signal of distress, when in fact it does a whole range of different things in actual social interaction in the wild. So the upshot of all of this is that if we only ever focus on how we think human interaction works rather than what people actually do in interaction, and if AI only learns from stereotypical notions of how human distress works, we'll limit all the conversational products and technologies that we want to develop.